All right, um, the joining numbers have slowed down, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the Community Land Scotland Meet the Pioneers session on community-led place planning. Um, Community Land Scotland has been running a session on Meet the Pioneers on various topics, um, which you can see in our Vimeo or on our website. Um, there may be some other topics which interest you. Um, and today we're looking at different community approaches to place planning. So the agenda for today is, um, I'm gonna do some housekeeping and scene setting. Um, I'm Carrie Doyle and I'm a, a staff member at Community Land Scotland. And then we are going to have a presentation um, from the Because We Say So um, team um, behind the local place plan at Kimning Park, Park Complex, which is um, coming from Nikki Patterson. And then after that, we have Jess Parker, um, who's an artist or creative practitioner as, as we um, term her in our business, um, who worked on the Owning Our Futures project in Peebles in the south of Scotland. Um, and then after those presentations, we should have plenty of time for Q&A um, and hopefully we'll get away a bit early. We have an hour and a half booked for this um, webinar. So a bit of housekeeping about the event. Um, this is structured as a webinar, as you've probably figured out, joining us, which um, does limit the opportunities for interaction, um, but we've had so many participants, we just wanted to keep that um, keep everyone's cameras and microphones off and keep everything nice and tidy. Um, but we do want to encourage interaction. So what we would say is use the chat for discussion. And I know some people have already been doing that. So the chat function is for discussion. Anything that you want to raise to attendees, you can put in there. Um, the Q&A function, which is next to the chat function, those are questions for the presenters. So if there's a specific question you want answered by the presenters, put it in the Q&A. Um, and as a facilitator, I'll go through those and we'll have a discussion around the questions at the end after the presentations. Um, my colleague, Christina Nitsilova is doing the event support. And if you have any technical issues, you can send her a message um, and she'll try and help you out with that and get back to you. Um, there's a bit of chat happening on Twitter as well. And I've put the handles up there if you want to go and see what's happening over there on Twitter. Um, the event is being recorded um, and the recording and the chat are going to be circulated after the event to people who have registered and it'll be hosted on our websites and things. Um, and we have activated the closed captioning. So um, that should be an option for you if you need closed captioning. Um, so to get started with um, my my overview, um, I just wanted to start with a, who is Community Land Scotland? Um, so we are the representative voice for Scotland's community landowners. We were set up about 10 years ago um, by individuals involved in the um, land reform and community buyouts um, previous to sort of 2011 when we were set up. There's a photo of, of the original founders of Community Land Scotland. And to summarize what we do, I, I've put it here as, as in terms of what we think, um, Community Land Scotland, thinks that unequal land ownership still needs to be addressed. So land reform is introduced um, starting in 2003 was, was the start of the contemporary era of land reform to address you know, issues of unequal land ownership and the impacts of communities that come from that. And we think that those issues still remain and still need to be addressed to advocate um, for more land reform. Um, and we also think that community ownership should be a normal straightforward option for communities across Scotland. Our members are community owners, they know the benefits of community ownership and they want to be um, sure that other communities can access those benefits and also think that it should be easier for other communities. What do we do? Um, we work with community groups buying land or buildings and we work to change the conditions for community ownership. So where are we now with community ownership? I, I sort of refer there briefly to the history of community ownership. Well, as of, of 2019, um, Scottish government statistics showed 590 assets owned by 418 community groups covering a very large area. Um, and here's some photos of, of some sort of recent community assets, some interesting things. Communities own all different types of buildings um, and land for all different types of uses and are doing amazing things in terms of renovating historic buildings, putting in place um, resilience and, and mitigation measures against climate change, um, managing green belt spaces. There's a picture there of Scotland's first community owned seaweed farm, which is um, being built 
um, in the Isle of Mole. And there's some pictures from Town Center Regeneration down in, in um, Dumfries, so called our members Mid Steeple Quarter. Um, what do I do as part of all of this? Well, my job at Community Land Scotland is as the Community Ownership Hub Manager. Um, the Community Ownership Hub is a project focusing on urban land reform specifically and within urban land reform focusing on Glasgow and the Clyde Valley. Um, we launched ourselves earlier this year. The, the aim of the project is to encourage and enable more community ownership through trying out some new approaches um, from Community Land Scotland's perspective. So increased support to groups, action research on a number of topics and promotion of land reform. We've got our website there. Um, and I've put my full credentials up there to say, um, I've done, I suppose that's my way of saying that I'm a town planner because I'm gonna say a few things about, about spatial planning and town planning in a minute. And I say that from the perspective of someone who has worked as a planner before and has reached research social planning in the way that communities interact with the planning system. Um, at Community Land Scotland, we provide support for groups seeking ownership. We do signposting and explanation of who can help groups who have, who have a vast range of different challenges and projects that they're implementing. Um, so signposting is always really important. We provide support for community groups who are looking to, to buy out land and buildings from private landowners. That's what we specialize in. Um, and this typically starts with an initial review of what the group wants to be doing and the sites they're interested in. We use available resources like the registers of Scotland, planning history and all those kinds of things to help groups understand the sites they're interested in so that they can make decisions on what they want to do next. Um, any questions about all that, definitely get in touch with ourselves, but I'm not gonna, gonna explain much more about community land Scotland's work at the minute. Let's get into the questions of community led place planning. Um, so, I have a few sort of scene setting sl sides that slides that I wanted to start with that I think that Nikki and Jess will speak to um, in a really interesting way. And I've put this quote up um, from Jane Jacobs, um, who is a, a famous urban planner. Um, and I say urban planner because she's American and that's the term, not town planners. Um, and I've included this because I noticed that um, the Royal Town Planning Institute, which is the professional membership, um, body for town planners had a session um, recently about um, Jane Jacobs and her legacy. And one of her great legacies was the need for community perspectives in town planning. So in 1960, 61 years ago, um, this is, is what she wrote, which I'll, which I'll, I'll read to you for a minute. Um, in New York's East Harlem, there is a housing project with a conspicuous re rectangular lawn, which became the became an object of hatred to the project tenants. And when she asked why, the response was, nobody cared what we wanted when they built this place. They threw our houses down, they pushed us here and pushed our friends somewhere else. We don't have a place around here to get a cup of coffee, coffee or a newspaper even, or to borrow 50 cents. Nobody cared what we need, but the big men come and look at the grass and say, isn't that wonderful? Now the poor have everything. Now, Jane Jacobs. Um, bringing that perspective to us um, and you know the legacy of, of, of town planning is that communities have struggled to engage with local place planning for a very long time. It's been an acknowledged issue and there's no clear solutions at this point. Scotland 2021, where are we? Well, the National Planning Framework Position Statement, which came out last year, um, noted that we need to do more to ensure that a wider range of people get involved in planning and to promote collaborative approaches over conflict. Um, so town planners are, are currently anxiously awaiting the new national planning framework, which is gonna be coming out in draft this fall. Um, and here we are working to try and involve people in planning, try to understand how communities can do effective place planning. So different ways communities can get involved in place planning. At the minute, I just started listing these off the top of my head this morning, and I'm sure I've missed some. So pop them in the Q and A, and we can we can add them if you, if we want to. Um, communities can get involved in consultations on a specific planning application. They can comment on local authority development plans. Um, there's something called charrettes, which were very popular maybe 10 years ago and are, are still kicking around, um, which which has happened and provide lots of value to things. There's locality place plans. Um, there's community action plans and there's local place plans with regulations still to be introduced. And I have a feeling that Nikki's gonna talk about that more. So there's a lot of different ways that communities can engage with planning applications and try and deal with these challenges, which Jane Jacobs so eloquently identified 60 years ago, 
to how do they work? What are the benefits? What are the, the negatives associated with all of this? I think the, sort of the, the key point that we're gonna focus on today is what are some of the community experiences around this? Um, and what are different ways we can approach these challenges to try and, and put in place community perspectives in these wider planning processes? One thing that is important to think about, and I think maybe changes things in terms of other discussions about community-led place planning, is that Scottish communities benefit from some of the strongest rights over land internationally. Um, so there's community rights to buy land and buildings, and I've listed three of the most um, powerful community rights to buy in Scotland. Um, communities have funding which includes the Scottish Land Fund, as well as, as many other different types of funding that communities can draw down to buy land and buildings and implement their ideas over how place could be developed. There's political support for community ownership and generally for having rights over land, including a new land reform act, which the new government has committed to and doubling the size of the Scottish Land Fund from 10 million to 20 million. So there's that political support. And then there's also these processes that communities can involve with through planning, including local place plans, which are being implemented. Um, so lots of strong rights, but there's a lot of processes. This is all quite confusing. Even if you're a planner like me, there's a lot to deal with. What do communities think of all of it? I mean, ultimately um, what we want at Community Land Scotland and what, you know, and the many groups we work with, including the Scottish government is, is to take communities from objecting to planning applications and from occupying land and buildings. I have a picture there from Govan Hill Bath, which is an occupation history as is Kinning Park, um, where Nikki is coming from. So how do we take it from the position where communities feel like they need to occupy land and buildings that they want to protect or object to planning applications in a conflicting way and turn it to a situation where communities can use their rights to make pl places the way that they want them to act proactively. Um, so, that is all I'm going to say on these really big, long-standing, important issues in, in planning, because what we really want to do is we want to learn from the communities, um, from their own experiences, um, and see what kind of different perspectives and learning that they have for us. So let's meet our pioneers. Um, Nikki is going to go first, and then Jess. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and Nikki will start sharing his. Thank you, Kerry. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Nikki Patterson. I am the Community Learning and Development Officer at Kinning Park Complex. Um, the presentation I've got for you just now is going to focus on the uh, main project that I, I am tasked to deliver just now. I'm not going to speak so much about uh, Kinning Park Complex or KPC as it's referred to um, so much, but I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions you've got about that um, in the, the Q&A session. Um, we were uh, we we applied for the investing communities fund from the Scottish government uh, to deliver a local place plan, and at the time we had uh, quite a small staff number, and uh, KPC quickly decided to take on um, somebody in the role that, that I've filled um, to deliver this, um, to the capacity, um, and also to do the thing justice. As Kerry was mentioned, it's not. Um, fully legislated for, and the the model of local place plans is still very much um, to be determined. So we're starting, if you like, with a fairly blank canvas of sorts, uh, and we've taken a lead from the Scottish Community and Developments, uh, sorry, Scottish Community Development Centre, who were working with Nick Wright. Um, to develop a kind of position statement or proposal for how local place plans ought to be done. Um, and we've taken that and, and kind of uh, put a bit more, or even more, if you like, community learning and development principles and practice behind that to, to really um, try and give it some, some edge and teeth. Um, and also a bit like KPC during its occupation and Govan Hill Baths and other places around the country. Um, make sure that direct action is still going to be part of the tactics for, for local groups and organisations and the strategy overall um, to empower local people to determine how their neighbourhoods and communities take shape over the, the, the next generation or so. So I'm going to talk about is a, an overview of the area that uh, I'm working in, uh, an overview of uh, the approach we have to local place plan, 
what our strategy, uh, practical strategy, um, week to week is for building up an evidence base, uh, community engagement and delivery of the local place plan, and a little bit about how that's working. There's quite a lot to fit in uh, to 20 minutes, um, and I'm absolutely happy to answer any and all questions in the, in the Q&A if you feel I've missed anything or not addressed um, something that you, you have a, a query on. So the area for a local place plan is in the east end of the Govan Ward in Glasgow, just south on the south keys of the River Clyde, situated in between Govan Town Centre um, and Gorbals, and it's bounded on the south quite uh, quite hard, if you like, by the M8 motorway and to the north by the River Clyde. It's got a population of about 12,000 people, about seven neighbourhoods, although Pacific Key um, is, is a fairly recent sort of commercial um, development, where well, that's where the BBC is situated, STV, science, the Glasgow Science Centre and so on. Um, and in any case, we're incorporating that in because we feel that in terms of the regeneration of that part of the, the docks and the quayside, uh, local people ought to have um, a say on, on maybe how that takes shape and how they can uh, get access to the services and facilities down there. I'll maybe try and refer back to this map because a couple of things I'm going to talk about in a, in a minute will make, maybe make more sense with this, this graphic, um, especially in terms of the area's connectivity uh, to the, the surrounding neighbourhoods. Um, so there's a lot of information here, but uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll try and just give a, a, a summary. Effectively, the area we were looking at, there was formerly a congruent set of neighbourhoods uh, based on the, the industries shipbuilding and uh, dock, dock lands and so on at the, the key sides of the Clyde. The construction of the Amy and the Kingston Bridge cut right through um, the, one of the bigger neighbourhoods there, Kingston, and uh, led to the decomposition and degradation of the, that neighbourhood space. The Amy construction also um, squeezing the area in between the motorway itself and the river uh, created this corridor effect and people who live there and people who live outside of it, including the local authorities, refer to this area as the Paisley Road West corridor. So the Paisley Road West is the main is the, the main road that runs through the area. Uh, and of course, from a community learning and development point of view, or even from a place making and planning point of view, um, it, it's, it strikes strikes it strikes me and strikes many people as odd that people would refer to the place they live as a corridor. Um, we want to try and nudge that towards it being a home and giving people a sense of more, more of a sense of ownership. These sort of um, geographical developments have, have dislocated the, the area from the neighbourhoods to the south, in particular Pollock Shields. Um, and with that as well, the, 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 the area is bookended by two quite severe motorway junctions that carry quite a lot of freight. Uh, and make it accessible only um, by cars at those two ends, the east and west end. Um, and there's one, one uh, road bridge in from Port Shields, and there's one road bridge into Anderson at the Squinty Bridge, which I'm sure many, many of you will be familiar with. This uh, corridor effect has also led to um, the area being overlooked in terms of investment and community engagement work. Gorbals uh, to the east and Govan to the west have had significant uh, attention and investment given in locality plans recently. And uh, we've recognised that the local place plan is an opportunity to maybe do some of that or, uh, from a community-led position. Moreover, the, the, the general narrative uh, to the area is, is one of deindustrialization over the, the course of the last 30 or 40 years. This has led to an increase in vacant and derelict land a decomposition in terms of the, 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 the cohesiveness of, of uh, housing and um, the logic of where industrial and commercial zones are located. Uh, and apart from anything else, the, the area is dominated quite heavily by uh, car use, um, although the, the, the public transport is uh, fairly good, but people do depend on cars and we have a lot of really fast traffic cutting through the area. So that's a little bit about the quality of the neighbourhood. 
The demographics um, are mixed. We actually have one of the top, uh, I think, top 3% um, data zones from the Scottish Index for Multiple de uh, Deprivation. But we also have one in the bottom 10%. And by and large, we have uh, most, most of our uh, population are in the, the lower 40%. Um, so it is, it is a mix in terms of socioeconomic status. Um, but we also think uh, on our analysis that some of this is skewed due to the area's low, uh, proximity to the city centre and that the um, analysts have given some, some weighting to that, uh, assuming, I think, and I think there are a number of documents about that make the assumption that people who are living in this area use the city centre for um, access to, to lots of services and facilities. And in fact, in our... Uh, the work we've done so far this year in our community engagement and conversation work, um, that, that isn't the case. So that's just an interesting sort of um, aspect to, to the validity of this data. No, there is, I'm not saying it's invalid, it's just that there's some significance to, to the weighting. So uh, historical context, uh, I've already touched on a bit of this, but it was shipbuilding centre um, from the 70s, uh, deindustrialization with a post-industrial decline, it's had an impact on the neighbourhood quality and composition. Glasgow had a kind of return to the river type ethic from the late 1980s, uh, spearheaded, if you like, by the Garden, the festival that was actually situated right slap bang in the middle of the uh, local police plan district in 1988. Um, but since the, since the end of that festival, um, the, the regeneration or potentially gentrification of, of the, the riverside, um, which it seems to have been to the benefit of commercial interests and, and larger kind of house builders, has led to a kind of disarticulation of the communities who emerged and, and developed on the side, on the, on, the, on the back of the industry at the Clyde, from the river itself. And if, you're ever, if, you, if you ever try and walk along, in fact, the length of, of our area's um, attachment to, to the river, so along the quayside, effectively, uh, you very quickly find how difficult that is. Um, and that's something we're trying to address through our, our conversations and in, ten, uh, in terms of problematizing um, the, the area overall in, ter in terms of place, identity, uh, sense of belonging, and visioning for the future. These impacts of, uh, or these dynamics have, have led to a kind of fragmentation of communities of place, identity and interest. And I think that is borne out um, by the, uh, perhaps by the example uh, or the, the fact that people refer to it as the Paisley Road West Corridor. Although there are a number of distinct neighborhoods in the area, um, the cohesiveness between these um, isn't as good as it could be and isn't as good as it is in other parts of the city and the country. It's an area with historically low community engagement rates, a low number of community organisations, and while that all that's happening, there's quite high levels of migration coming in. So integration is a key um, a key issue that, uh, that we're wanting to develop and promote. There are 74 languages spoken within this area, and while all that's happening, we have the extant or traditional uh, working class populations. Um, to who to varying degrees and different extents are um, struggling with an identity crisis based upon um, Brexit and other political dynamics such as uh, Scottish independence or the question of Scottish independence. And also uh, it's an area with historically strong links to the north of Ireland and the, the politics there. So they have an impact on the social dynamics and intercultural and intercommunity dynamics. And of course, because of the investment in govern and gorbals um, and the kind of general decomposition of the quality of, of the neighbourhood facilities and services, uh, there is a, a strong perceived competition over, over resources. Um, and on top of all that, we have the, the area was developed in the, the 19th and early 20th century and certainly wasn't built with uh, access in mind. And in fact, there are very few shop fronts and services that people can access if they depend on um, mobility aids. So that's something we are, we're also looking to try and address through a local plan. 
As I said earlier, we took uh, Nick Wright and the Scottish Community Development Centre's um, approach to our local place plan as an opportunity to flip the system and change the power dynamics that determine how um, places are made, so to speak, planned and developed, um, and to try and win some power back for, for local people to determine how, how they um, want their neighbourhoods and their community spaces to develop, rather than leaving it to um, detached uh, planning systems and to the interest of, of uh, land developers and housing developers and so on. It's also, uh, from a CLD point of view, uh, an opportunity for the public to learn and understand more about their place, its problems and potentials, uh, or, or potential solutions, and to understand the dynamics that um, underpin their, their everyday life, everyday neighbourhood life, sense of place, belonging, and so on. And we also want to take this as an opportunity to establish a model for how local people can lead on planning and decision making in their neighbourhoods. Our ultimate aim is to set up a local strategic system for community-led development. It's led by local people for local people and to achieve the quality of neighbourhoods and communities that they want. We've taken uh, as a, uh, we, we felt that local place plan was kind of vague um, or concept, certainly concept, conceptually vague for um, kind of lay people to understand. It certainly took me a lot of, uh, a number of weeks to, to get my head around what it was, what it could be, and how, how it could be prosecuted. Essentially, we've broke, broken it down into three main terms, that, or three main watchwords, if you like, and these are that it's a community-led, as in local people leaning, the leading facilitated by professional CLD workers, supported and resourced appropriately um, by those official organisations and networked organisations who are in a position to do that, Kenny Park Complex, as an example of a, an anch the anchor organisation on this local place plan that is resourcing um, much of their activity. Neighbourhood, as opposed to place, we felt this was more uh, conceptually co coherent, had a bit more meaning, uh, and allowed people to conceptualise how they were accessing the, and using um, the, the places and spaces around their, their home and their workplace in an everyday sense. And the blueprint, um, we have taken the, the line of local place plan should incorporate uh, an A to Z, if you like, of community action plans and other long-term and short-term and everywhere in between determinations. Um, and the, the local place plan itself has a, a, a funded, hopefully in future, more uh, consistently funded and resourced as a strategy for delivery and iterative review of, of local people's determinations in coordination and collaboration with uh, local planning officials uh, and, and other relevant agencies. We've adopted a critical approach, understanding the histories and biographies of the area that we're working in, um, understanding that, that um, loss and trauma are part of, part of the story here, not ignoring these, that these, this has meaning to people uh, and that we're not about erasure of um, people's lived experiences. This means that we understand that assets, uh, while assets are crucial, uh, we're not taking a, a, a typical uh, asset-based community development approach to this, um, because much of this is to do with storytelling and understanding place and sense of belonging. To that end, um, we uh, work on the basis that we have to embed our practitioners within the neighbourhoods over a long period of time, um, building conversation, applying our, our principles and pra uh, practices uh, every day using dialogical methods to build trust, engagement, uh, and also the facilitation of um, the development of skills, knowledge, and understanding um, for local people. Training local people up, getting them into volunteer positions, um, identifying uh, what their interests are and how, how um, what, what their route to empowerment might be, and building leadership within the, the local area through that. Uh, and all the while mapping these stories and experiences, so generating a culture of dialogue, uh, celebration, and problematizing as we go. And while we're doing that, we're also identifying needs, wants, and interests, and establishing or developing groups of place and of interest and experience to build the capacity, build the network up 
um, of community groups, projects and organisations that are determined on their own terms and facilitated by local place plan and by organisations such as Kenning Park Complex. Our outcomes are that the local player will, uh, will have established a blueprint. So the local place plan we're calling a blueprint um, because we want it to be an iterative process and we want it to be an A to Z of community action plans. Um, they'll have established a blueprint for how their communities and neighbourhoods will develop in the coming years. They will have an area network of uh, groups, projects and organisations um, to, to facilitate dialogue, resource sharing, decision making. They will have within that the tools to assess their needs and ass assets on a continual basis and have the resources to respond to these as appropriate, or at least the knowledge of how to access the resources as appropriate. They have the tools to analyse change, determine what changes take place and how to hold higher powers and decision makers to account where it, when and where appropriate. And they'll have the tools to maintain and develop their local place plan and their local area network. One of the things we're using a key concept in our strategy is um, the, con the 20 minute neighbourhood. Um, we're currently working in an area that wouldn't be considered the 20 minute neighbourhood. Um, that there are, there are a number of issues that, that go into this, including uh, poor, uh, low uh, sense of place identity, um, the, the decomposition of neighbourhood fabric, uh, no, sorry, the neighbor, decomposition of neighbourhood sort of, um, uh, how, how the neighbourhoods composed, decomposition, decomposition of how it's composed, but I hope you get the point now, my head's gone a bit blank. Um, yeah, and she, using that this concept to problematise how people, um, what, how, what their day-to-day -day experience of uh, neighbourhood life is, what's missing, what's good, and what needs to come in. And using that within uh, the, this 20-minute neighbourhood concept has been very useful for us in getting people to sharpen their uh, thoughts and why they have to go into the city centre, for example, or, or into Govan Town Centre, and why they're not able to access their everyday needs and services along the Paisley Road West or within uh, a 20-minute walk or wheel from their uh, front door. As I said, this uh, it's the tangible scale is very useful. Um, it's the, it's certainly introduced the opportunity for us to discuss the use of cars, uh, not not just the speed of traffic, but parking um, is is a big issue in the area, and that that in turn allows us to introduce some uh, themes and concepts around climate change, uh, quality and safety of neighbourhood environments, um, the quality of local park spaces, green spaces, uh, and so on. Uh, and it also introduces the dynamics of accessibility and ableism. Um, allows us to put that scale and uh, try and shift that scale towards something that's a wee bit more universal um, and democratic. Um, yeah, the town centre approach is something that is uh, within the 20-minute neighbourhood concept is something that we feel, uh, and, and local people have responded to quite well as well, um, a, a kind of response to the degradation of uh, place identity and so on to restore some civic pride, developing the quality of the neighbourhood fabric, especially I think the paths uh, and roads um, that people are using because the, the place is, uh, you need a tank really to get over some some of the, the paths and pavements. And moving, moving toward the de uh, democratisation of access to shops and services and facilities so on um, without um, all, all the while trying to mitigate maybe some of the excesses of gentrification that could be creeping in from um, some parts of the city close by. Um, we don't want, we want to provide a bulwark against people being displaced um, from this area and just being shifted continually around the city and other parts of the country um, just because they're being outpriced or that the shops and services that they use every day are closing down and being replaced by more expensive ones. Development work is a key uh, approach in our strategy here, developing groups, um, establishing groups based on conversations around interest and need, um, groups of interest and place, facilitating their training and development so they can improve, um, consolidate their, their skills and, and develop them, these and facilitate intergroup dialogue to build a better network 
of groups and projects and organisations, utilising the resources of places like Kenning Park Complex, Gal Gale and so on, and building that network um, that can then, uh, that's, that's based on dialog a dialogical approach to the collaboration and coordination for, to address community need and play planning. Raises the, this raises the baseline of community assets, it raises the baseline of knowledge, skills, capacity and power and so on. Um, and, it, and it means we can, through the local place plan and other, other things, um, we can have a networked delivery of engagement work that, that builds a consistent mode of conversation and analysis. Um, and on, through that network, then we can also um, determine priorities and actions for local place plans and other uh, similar things. Um, informed by an extensive period of dialogue among an increasingly broad range of uh, a broad and comprehensive range of stakeholders. As I say, we're, we're using the 20 minute neighbourhood concepts being very, very useful for building conversations and building um, analytical conversations um, that go just that go a little bit beyond just the simple storytelling, actually introduced problematizing to the situation. We have um, regular as in weekly uh, twice twice a week in fact um, we do some mapping as we go sessions which are basically um they could be called territorial inquiries an investigation of, of the local area collectively um, to visualize um uh, solutions um things that people want to talk about things that are bad things that need to change and also to talk about those things that are good and need to be preserved and enhanced or developed uh, and so on and this, this has been building a conversation on priorities for action while uh, engaging people in, in biographical storytelling, historical storytelling, political storytelling, and so on. Um, and that's building the knowledge and, and, and um, understanding base. And through this, this has been a great conduit for building, uh, for, for the development of local volunteers taking a leading role in mapping and data gathering, as well as setting priorities and action. This is facilitated by CLD workers. We see that as crucial. Um, we would recommend that, that local police plans are delivered via uh, community learning and development workers, first and foremost, in collaboration with um, town planners and, uh, and other relevant agencies, but the CLD workers are the, the, uh, uh, at the front of the facilitation of community engagement and conversation. This is because of our approach and our principles and practice principles, builds trust and uh, facilitation techniques and has a much more deeper and meaningful understanding of people and place. Um, and we build build these groups, uh, two, two emerging groups that we facilitate in our friends, Friends of Festival Park and the Kingston DIY Skate Park, two place-based groups that have emerged from the work uh, we've done over the last few months. We facilitate these through brainstorming sessions, which are, which are effectively um, fun, engaging, but critical activities that allow groups to set their own priorities for action. And then we facilitate their, um, we do, do some analysis and provide them with a strategy, and then we facilitate them, the, them delivering the strategy while facilitating their being better embedded uh, within the network of other local uh, groups, projects, and organisations. I've got a funny feeling I'm running on. I've, I can't actually see any uh, time, so just give me a shout if it's going on. I, yeah, Nikki, I'm, I'm just coming coming on to say probably wrap it up in the next five minutes. Does that sound good? Minutes, okay. I'll yeah, okay, no probs. Um, yeah. So the, this uh, the work we're doing is building for consistent. Um, and reg uh, yeah, so no, sorry, we're also building for consistent and regular community activities, which is linked to neighbourhood and uh, place in particular, as well as to communities of interest. One um, major uh, project we've got is the annual festival coming up at the end of this month. Be the Pais it's called the Paisley Road West Fest, based around cultural activity, which itself is related to the kind of uh, political folk culture of uh, the Clyde side, um, working class history. Uh, an experience, and we are uh, developing that into a sort of reclaim the Clyde side type approach for our some of our local place plan work to do some engagement around um, critical understanding of place as well as problematizing the neighborhoods, as well as identifying uh, sites that may 
might be brought into community ownership uh, going forward. And if they were brought into community ownership, how people um, see those uh, sites developing, what what will they be? Um, one example, uh, just one example, is that there, there is zero youth provision in our area, uh, and one of um, one of their local aims is that we would have a, a, a youth led youth organisation um, at some point in the near future from this sort of work. Also, through this developing the local area network that I've been referring to um, for strategy coordination, resource sharing, as well as prioritisation. And oh, that's me at the end. Brilliant. OK. Um, all right, so that, that was a, yeah, a bit of a, a one-on-one tour. Um, hopefully enough detail for you to, to be able to ask me some questions, um, and which I'll be happy to answer. I know we didn't touch on KPC as such. I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have on that. Um, you can, you can, if you've got your phone with you, you can scan that um, QR code there. It'll take you to all of our link tree. Otherwise, please do visit our website to find out some more information and the full strategy on our local place plan and how we are going about it uh, is at the, the second address down there. Otherwise, please do contact us at hello at because we say so dot score. I'm sure Christina and Kerry will pass on other um, those contact details uh, towards the end. Anyway, great. Thanks very much. For sure, yeah. Thanks, Nikki. That was really great insight into all the amazing work you're doing there. Um, there's a few questions in the Q&A. So if attendees want to have a think and pop some more in, that would be great. And we're going to hand over now to Jess Parker to talk about her work and Peebles. Thanks, Carrie. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can see it, yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for allowing me to speak today about um, the creative process that I undertook in Peebles. Um, and excuse me if I need to clear my voice a couple of times. Uh, I've, I'm recovering from a cold at the moment. Um, but I'll speak for about 15 to 20 minutes um, about how the creative process helped the town of Peebles plan for the future. Uh, this includes being briefed by the community trust um, learning about the town, drawing out insights uh, from the people, and developing a creative output to continue the conversation about community ownership. So how I came to work with Peebles, uh, it was in October last year, uh, I saw Community Land Scotland was promoting a project called Owning Our Futures, and they were looking for six creative practitioners and each one would be partnered with a community for six weeks to explore the role of community ownership during COVID-19 and also to help them look forward to the future. So I applied to be partnered with the People's Community Trust down in the Scottish borders. Uh, that's about an hour's bus ride south of Edinburgh for me. And during the interview process, I was informed of the assets that the trust already owns um, these include the Shields Community Woodland, the School Bray Hub, which is currently used as a reuse hub where people bring in their um, secondhand or unwanted items or goods and the profits from those are sold and um, go back into the community trust. And also uh, there is a site which used to be the town's main tweed mills but have been up against uh, developers for a number of years. There are allotments on, these site, on, on this site, as you can see in the photo in the bottom right. And uh, this has been really beneficial for the community. Uh, they've had open days there where they sell produce and fundraise money for local, um, local community groups. People's Community Trust has also developed a town action plan. And this is to address issues that are important to locals and to highlight the achievements. And 
um, the action plan is, is being refreshed and the trust wanted to feed any insights from the creative process into, into their border plan. The trust was particularly keen to hear from young people in the creative process so they could be part of shaping their future and the, they have a relationship with the high school um, and students were displaced after a fire uh, at the end of 2019 and they've had a rough time so the trust was keen to hear from them. And I worked with two key members of the People's Community Trust, Alex, their coordinator, and Crick, a senior member of the trust. And these are some outcomes uh, from for Community Land Scotland. They wanted um, insights, uh, some video footage and pictures uh, so they could use these in further work and discussions with policymakers and agencies. So to move on to the research, um, I knew of Peebles having visited the town once or twice, but I wasn't a resident, so I wanted to learn as much as I could before starting any creative activity. And to give you a short overview of Peebles, they have a population of around 9,000 people. Um, historically, it was a, a big textile town uh, and it had a, a railway, um, a rail station, uh, but they're both gone now. It's, it's considered a commuter town with a lot of people traveling to Edinburgh for work. Uh, it relies on tourism to boost the local economy. And uh, every year they have one or two sporting events that attract runners and cyclists uh, from across the country. But COVID-19 altered the working and economic patterns of the, of the town. Workers stayed in Peebles. They had more time to spend at home and outdoors and also to shop locally. And although tourist numbers dropped during the pandemic, uh, they also received more visitors from other Scottish towns and cities. And Peebles also has some very socially active people in their community. During the pandemic, various people, groups, businesses worked together to reach out to those who needed help. Um, a lot of food parcels and medication were delivered to those who were self-isolating, vulnerable, or couldn't make it out themselves. And um, other residents who found themselves at home with nothing to do also volunteered their time at community buildings. So these are some of the things I learned in the first few weeks of the project. Um, I was taken on a long walk around the town. Um, I also read some literature on the history of Peebles, followed a lot of Facebook groups that people from Peebles had created. Um, they, this provided a lot of uh, local insider knowledge. Uh, and I wanted to collect a wide range of opinions and experiences from those who lived and worked in Peebles. So I interviewed a journalist, an artist and gallery manager, um, a business owner, an outdoor event organizer, volunteers, and people who helped run several, several community groups and projects. Uh, but we did hit a snag quite early on when we found out that uh, we couldn't get access to the high school to speak to students due to the COVID restrictions. Um, all we could uh, go with uh, was the, <clears throat> excuse me, was the youth club. And we organized a workshop with some of the young people to collect their opinions and thoughts for the future. Uh, despite only having access to the youth club, it was still uh, really, really valuable uh, information provided from the young people there. And by this stage, there were insights already emerging from the research. Uh, I use these to plan for the creative activity to get the public to imagine the future of the town. Uh, I went down the path of speculative design because I wanted participants to experience a change in the familiar space, um, to question how buildings or green spaces that they see and uh, walk through and use every day uh, to be more productive and bring people closer together. So, uh, these imaginary cards 
were created to kickstart people's imaginations and um, get them thinking about how their community could be strengthened. They've been designed especially for peoples based on the interviews and conversations with people. All the photos in the background of these cards are various locations and peoples and are easily recognizable to, to residents. The reason why I chose to illustrate the, the ideas on each card uh, was to be playful and encourage people to think of their own ideas and hopefully get them to uh, draw their own on blank pieces of card that were also provided to them. And by using illustrations instead of photos, um, it prevented folk from being overly critical about the idea, about the cards themselves. Uh, so I'll quickly talk through each card and how they came about. Uh, this first one is a delivery bike uh, that could be community owned. It delivers food and prescriptions to people who can't leave the home. Uh, having bikes deliver goods instead of, uh, sorry, having bikes deliver goods uh, also lowers emissions and fewer cars on the high street, uh, which is a contentious issue in Peebles. Uh, the chicken coop is to encourage people to eat locally and sustainably. Um, for example, when I showed this card to one person, she told me about the large chicken factory uh, that's just outside of Peebles and said how their company, that company claims to um, have organic eggs, but their process is very industrial. Uh, the staff uh, come over from, from overseas and um, she thought it would be much better if chickens could be raised in a more natural environment and closer to home. Uh, so already by um, using these cards, uh, it's getting people to um, be more critical of uh, things like food systems. The next one is a hut containing free firewood. This was in reference to the woodlands purchased from the council and now managed by the community. They're conserving different species uh, in, in the woods now, um, including a rare moth, and they also have plans to harvest their own timber. So this card was to make people aware of, of the woodland and uh, have them think about how and where the harvested wood could be distributed to the community. The apple tree card came from in an interview with the founder of a charity called Cook Your Own. And he runs classes on how to cook meals using seasonal produce. Uh, he also helped plant a community orchard with fruit trees in the town and uh, spoke of ben the benefits of growing your own food. And when he went to speak at a local school, he was also shocked by the lack of fresh ingredients in the home economics class and how the students weren't taught about where the food comes from. Um, he observed that they are, they're handed prepackaged ingredients bought from the shop, uh, given a recipe, and, and then they go away and make the meals. Uh, so this inspired the next card, um, where a child is reading a book, uh, and it questions whether there should be more um, learning materials that are freely accessible. And when I showed this card to people at the youth club, it got some positive responses. Um, they said that they'd like to see many libraries like this one uh, close to schools. Uh, so it's easier to pick up books on their way home, um, especially since the access to the uh, libraries and schools have been reduced. The next card encourages more people to sit down and socialize, uh, something like a, a conversation bench. Uh, this idea came from reading people's lockdown experiences um, and a lot of older residents felt lonely and wished that they could go outside and, and meet people during the pandemic. And after walking around the town, I also noticed that there weren't many benches or tables in open areas. Um, and when I showed this card to young people, they also said that they wanted more sheltered seating. 
uh, because when it rains, uh, and, and it does a lot, <laughs> most students tend to stay indoors. And the last card is an idea for street art and murals in the town. And uh, there are a lot of old buildings in Peebles, and some say that it makes it look dull and gray, especially in winter. So if there was more color on the walls, um, this would make people's walks more enjoyable. And young people also said that, the, that they would like to see and take part in more art. So these cards were then printed, uh, A5 size and put into packs along with a survey with some questions and uh, blank cards for them to draw, on and draw their own ideas on as well. And the activity packs were handed out to interested participants who signed up and they completed the imaginary exercise in their own time. I would have liked to have accompanied people in groups to do the exercise, but due to COVID restrictions, uh, I wasn't able to do this. Um, I instead asked participants to take photos of the cards in places where they'd like to see change and email me those photos at the end of the activity. So now I'd like to show you some of the responses that I received. Um, in the top left is an old school building, I think, and uh, that's been uh, shut down and uh, someone had an idea to renovate it into affordable accommodation. Uh, there is a productive forest garden on the Tweed Green, a, uh, a sheltered seating inside a, a bandstand that now has locked gates, uh, an idea for a mural on a wall at the side of a playing field um, to convert an empty store on the high street into a board games cafe so young people have more entertainment. Uh, a couple of these insect friendly flower beds came up in, in um, specific, uh, specific spots in the town, as well as a historical graveyard tour. And a people's community bank, uh, a new space for the reuse hub in place of uh, what was the TSB bank, uh, a community market on the high street, a resource map for those who, ha who have just moved to the town uh, or are visiting, as well as a zero carbon supermarket. So, um, these were some of the ideas that the creative activity, activity generated. Um, a lot of interesting responses and it proved to be a, a useful way to find out which places could be better utilized and restored. And it also gave people an opportunity to share their new ideas for how to get others more actively involved in their community, um, improved biodiversity with more uh, gardens and beds and to learn about the history of their town. So all of these responses were then collated and um, suggestions for a final creative output were shared with Alex and Crick from the Trust. And then we spoke about the possibility of a manifesto, um, distributing informative flyers uh, about the Trust. So uh, more people in the community are aware of what they do. Um, there was an idea for an online gallery for all the uh, creative responses uh, where people can also add their own later on. Uh, but what we decided on in the end was an ideas map of peoples to continue uh, engagement with people after the project ended. So this is an illustrated map. It's intended to be quirky and have a comical style. Uh, similar to the illustrations on the cards. And uh, we wanted it to be a bit like Where's Wally, where you always stumble across something different uh, on the map and sometimes silly things too. Uh, so the, the dragon in the, in the top right corner is, is not relevant to peoples, but it also contains a lot of the ideas from the imagining activity. Um, you have the historical tours in the cemetery there, uh, the, the mini libraries, um, to protect the, the allotments in the mill site, um, the market on the high street and so on. And 
these, uh, this map, um, just like the town action plan, uh, can also be updated in the future with new ideas. It's been printed now. Um, it's about, it's A1 in size, so that makes it like a, a meter, uh, a meter wide. Um, and it's going to be displayed in the school Bray hub, uh, this building in the photo here, uh, once it's undergone its renovations. And a banner was also produced, uh, this pull up banner here on the right. And the trust will use this at markets, uh, schools and other events to continue uh, community engagement. And we hope it will continue to shift people's perceptions about what people could, could look like and um, highlight the positive aspect of community ownership and encourage more people to be act actively engaged as well. So using a creative approach uh, was new for the People's Community Trust, but uh, since being part of the Owning Our Futures project, they now have a map and uh, some supporting imagining cards to use in, in further engagement. And like the town action plan, it's uh, still in progress, which is still in progress. Um, the, the Link Paths project, uh, which is also looking at transport connections across peoples, um, the, the graphics from this are also contributing to uh, those things as well. And um, the graphics will be incorporated into the layout of the town action plan as well as an additional theme for culture and the arts and um, hopefully a, a young people theme as well. And that was uh, directly from the results of the Owning Our Futures project. And lastly, uh, for those who are interested in creative engagement, um, I have a list of uh, recommendations or uh, well, tips here, but uh, I recommend a longer facilitation period of maybe two to three months. Uh, there was only six weeks to learn and interview and promote and run a creative activity with the community, um, but it also clashed with the school finishing up for the year, uh, Christmas holidays and a cold snowy December. So this impacted on the number of people who could have taken part. Um, and if there are, oh here, uh, there's some useful links if anyone would like to read further about the trust, uh, the project itself, or see more photos and content from, from the project on my website. And that's me, thank you. Thanks, Jess. Um, that was really interesting to hear the insight. I've seen the cards around, but I hadn't heard the wider context and more about the project. So really good to see that. Um, there's a bit of chat. I'm looking at the side of my screen. Um, some positive things and thanks for the speakers there. Um, Jess and Nick, you'll have to check that out. In terms of specific questions, we've got a few in the Q&A, um, but not too many. So please keep them coming. Or if you have a question, um, you know, pop it in the chat and I will pick that up from this point forward. If you want, um, there, I'm just gonna get the questions up here. So there was, we've had two questions. Um, one is um, that Nikki's answered. And Nikki, I'm gonna ask you to come on and ex explain your answer verbally as well as writing. So I don't know if everyone can see what you've written there. So um, I think we should talk it through so people can, can understand that. The question is, um, is local place plan just a new name for Charette? Seems like there's a big overlap. What's the difference? And is it the length of engagement and the size of potential resource? Um, and what I would say maybe, Nikki, before you go through your answer is, um, you know, the, the question of length of engagement and potential resource, I think is really interesting as well. Um, that point about how long we're doing the work and who's resourcing it are, are key questions around all of this. Um, quickly, I mean, charrette tends, traditionally tends to be um, something that happens over a short period of time. So you would get the community together for like a weekend or a week or a set period of, of time to work through quickly through some design issues with experts. So that idea about bringing everyone together quickly to push through. Um, and obviously a local place plan has a really different time scale there. Um, Nikki, do you want to get into your response? I guess the, 
yeah, I guess the maybe the most uh, sensible way of putting it would be that. Well, I mean, first of all, like it's not clear what local place plans actually are yet. So we're still in the process of determining that. And the, the local place plans that are live are all um, attempts to, to establish a model for it. What I can say, though, is that we've, we've adopted the position that the local place plan ought to be um, both a locality plan and an urban development plan that is community led. And rather than designers and planners being at the forefront, well, well, clearly very, very important to the process, that it should be uh, the community-led. The, the best way to do community-led work is, is to have um, community development professionals there. Alongside creative, um, creative workers like Jess uh, to do that engagement work. So when it comes to the charrette, um, you know, we, we are, we are sort of thinking that a local place plan would be an A to Z of community action plans and also a whole host of other determinations that the, the public are really putting to the planning authorities um, and, the, and the policy makers to address. So it's an evidence base for, for what local people need and want, what they want to keep, what they want to change, what they want to get rid of. So the charrettes would come in as part of the process um, to facilitate the local place plan um, probably more on a, on a specific theme or a specific design issue or, or, or planning problem. Um, and, and so they would be very much part of the toolkit, if you like, of, of building a local place plan. Having said that, that is our position and we're taking quite a strong, like adopting quite a, a strong and radical position on that. In the end up, that might not be what the, the government decide to do with local place plans. However, we're just using it as an opportunity to do that anyway, as kind of trying to establish a model for best practice. Um, so yeah, in summary, charrettes would be part of the tool toolkit that we would use to establish an A to Z local place plan that covers an expansive area and is a, for me, it should have an iteration period of about a year in terms of conversation and, and building and design, so on. Does that, was that, did that make any sense? Yeah. Pop on the chat if, if you want any more detail on that. Yeah, and just to repeat, because I think Nikki and I have both said this, but it's important to stress the local place plan process is new and um, we're waiting on the regulations to, to be announced. They should be, I'm guessing, late this year, early next year. It'll, it'll be clear exactly how local place plans are going to work at this point. They've come down from the Planning Act and they're being tried out, but all of the details haven't been worked out yet. So. This is really is meet the pioneers doing things that are brand new. <laughs> um, there's we've got a good few questions coming through and I'm just having a quick look. Um, the first one is Nikki, have you managed to get any buy in to the process from newer gentrified community in the area? Um, it's an interesting question the, the harder to reach communities are tend to be those that are that are more marginalized and those who have more social and cultural capital tend to come forward quicker um, especially when it comes to involvement and taking some leadership so yes the folk who've who have come in with a wee bit um more capital in whatever form that comes in um are, are the ones that are buying in quicker and we're building the, the trust and the conversation with those harder to reach groups as we go, using some leadership from, from those who are already in a position of feeling confident and competent, competent enough to do that. I hope, that, I, I hope that's what you meant by the question, uh, Alistair, but if it's not, uh, let me know. Um, the other question is, uses an acronym I don't understand. Um, it's about, it says CLD, if CLD are involved in the work. Do you know that's what that means? Community, community <laughs> learning and development. That's uh, the community learning and development. Work. We're yeah. some planners with your acronyms, not worse than planners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for um, critical CLD practice um, tends not to skew towards local authority objectives, actually. Local authority objectives, government policy, the different planning frameworks that we're operating in, uh, can I set the parameters but they all, for, for our work, but they also 
at the same time set the set the uh, the limits which we want to challenge. Um, so in fact, and, and if something's supposed to be genuinely community led, then uh, you know parameters are important. But at the end of the day, so is having the option for direct action is you know always really useful as well. So no, in our case, no, we're quite. We do adopt quite a critical and radical position on this. Um, we work in partnership with local authority, but we also are advocates of um, the local community and collective voices. So, um, yeah, we are not going to necessarily just do, you know, what we're told, if you like, because we're funded to do critical work. So we'll do that, you know. Um, that's a good opportunity. Before I, I go there, Jess, come in when you're ready on any of these questions. We've got some coming up for you, but pipe up if you want. Um, I'm thinking that this question about skewing towards local authority objectives is a good way to pick up. There's another question about a politics, like the role of politics, basically, in all of this and whether or not it can be. There's a question about whether or not it can be apolitical. And then we've got a question here about does the politics always skew in one direction? Um, so they're actually related in, in a way. Um, and what I would say about that is that, you know, planning is political, even if you try and make it not political, it is political because you're developing things in places. Um, so you always have to see your way through these things in some way. And I think setting out your stall the way that Nikki has done really clearly about where his perspective and, and the way he sees it is really important because everyone's doing different political things and all of this very much open for discussion, but that's how I see it. Um, pop more questions on that one if you want. It's a shame that people can't come in for the discussion, but I will keep reading these and <laughs> out and we'll crack on. Um, the next say, one, like, go ahead, Nikki. Yeah. Yeah, I would just say, like, the, the, I asked, um, I think it was Alistair who asked about the apolitical. Um, can, can these processes be apolitical? Um, so I, I just asked Alistair for a bit more content about what he meant in this context, because as you say, um, I mean, part of our process in analysis and so on is doing a power analysis on, on where, who are the major kind of power brokers and decision makers within any community. And, and they're, they're quite often there to be challenged. So um, I think, it's, as you've alluded to, Kerry, the, the, the process itself is inherently and essentially political, in fact. But whether Alistair meant whether it's to do with the bigger like, party uh, politics as such, um, yeah, I mean, they, again, within the power analysis, they have a role to play, but they're also there to be challenged. Uh, they're there to support through resources and uh, everything else, but they are also there to be challenged. So, um, yeah. And I come at it from a perspective, a town planning perspective, where planners have often thought and often been taught previously in planning that like planning is somehow objective to these things. So there's a critical planning perspective, which gets planners to engage with these questions more because it's not really appropriate to think that you're not having an impact on power when you're doing this kind of work. Ultimately, you are if you're doing regeneration <laughs> um, in particular, but any type of planning. Anyway, moving on, because I think Jess has got, we got one here for Jess. <laughs> um, I'm going to go over the creative one and then we'll go back to the to the other one if you're reading the questions panelists. Um, does it does this type of creative approach help counter consultation fatigue? So Jess, I don't know if you, you have a sense for what, you know, Peebles was obviously well on their way to implementing a number of projects when you got involved. So, you know, did you come across consultation fatigue and did you have any sense generally about creative approaches? Also volunteer fatigue, the same volunteers often doing work in communities and community groups. Any tips for getting a wider range of people involved in volunteering? Yeah, I think I did witness volunteer fatigue, or I don't know if they were fatigued yet, but uh, <laughs> they look like uh, they're on their way to being fatigued. Um, but I found that the creative approach, uh, a creative approach was um, a way to counter the consultation process. Um, in fact, the, the participants who took part in the creative activity weren't involved with um with the trust itself uh there were the people from um the youth club there was a, a family of eight who uh weren't aware of of the trust yet and and what they did um there was uh someone from the arts who wasn't involved with the trust and she went on to do the activity with her neighbors as well and 
um, one or two more people. Um, so yeah, I think it was a, a bit refreshing to, to see a different approach or a different way of, of reaching people and getting them to take part. Um, and I, I try not to emphasize that it was for the, the um, People's Community Trust, but more of a, a collective thing for them to take part in. Um, so they wouldn't have this, uh, this bias if, if they did have a feel, any feelings that are, uh, it's always the same people involved in the trust, I don't want to take part. Um, so I want it to be an open thing. Yeah, I mean, I, there's probably opportunity there for either of the speakers to go a bit deeper in like how they engage different groups in their work and what they thought works well and what was particularly tricky about getting people involved. I, th I mean, I think it's one of the, the, the local place plan with it being such a vague and blank canvas, actually um, part of our strategy is to take people on where they're already at, so where their interests lie. So that may be community gardening, it might be um, just the local street, it might be why well, lots of people get up in arms about potholes, for instance, like it's a short term thing. But there are, there are, there are maybe more exciting things afoot as well, cultural activity and so on, and certainly creative, the creative, type of creative processes that Jess has employed are, are also part of that um, those tactics and approach. However, inevitably, um, I mean, consultation fatigue is really just a symptom of a general fatigue that people um, uh, get when when they're when they're involving themselves in sort of extracurricular activity, if you like, on a consistent basis. So, what I mean, the approach we take is that if it, you know, if everybody can just contribute a Lego brick as and when they can and they want to at a time, then that's really the only way to do any sort of sustainable community-led type um, work. And, and again, to, add, to it comes back to one of the previous questions, the longer um, that time period is, and that depends on funding, of course, and having uh, having at least a worker to lead on it, but the longer that time period is, the better quality and more meaningful um, data, you know, more meaningful conversations you're gonna have, more meaningful data you're gonna gather and so on. Um, and I think for us that's crucial and it's about building up competences and confidences within local people as well, not just getting them in to have their stay on like the whole town, but on something that they they um they are already inherently interested in. Um there's a question here about um, I'd love to hear from both speakers about what ideas or advice they would give to local places where community planning does not have a positive history, where people seem disengaged and community planning partners would like to change this. What can they do to stimulate activity where there isn't already a strong basis? Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> I mean, I can, like, I'm sorry, I like to talk so much, Jess, like, <laughs> just elbow in, when, elbow in when you want, mate. But um, yeah, the, the area we're working in between uh, Tradeston and Ibrox in Glasgow is um, it, do, it doesn't have a it doesn't have a positive history already, and it is, a, it is an area of low engagement. It actually, has a very low number of community organisations um, relative to other places in Glasgow, and the community organisations that are there also have only recently turned through the pandemic, and in fact, they're just before the pandemic, as it happens, towards being place-based rather than communities of interest. So effectively, that's what's informed our strategy here to try and build up the number of groups and projects within the area um, based on interest or place um, to, to establish that network and using that network really to, as the kind of the, the, the conduit for, for building conversation and gathering the, the data. So that's a much longer term strategy. It's not something that could be done within a short, let's say, or, or, or within a, a, a short and finite period of time. Um, yeah, so it, it means if you're starting from a low baseline, you've got to raise the baseline, right? So that's that's our, our strategy there. And that just takes some, some you know, donkey work, really. Um, there's no there's no like magic wand to be there. Um. I can just pop, you know, speak up if you want to give a bit of an intro, maybe to the creative side of things. So Community Land Scotland ran this 
program about owning our futures. And I think it was six different communities had different artists placed in them. Um, and I think the, the learning from that was that artists, you know, that creative approach and the artists all took really different approaches to the work they were doing, but they all brought different things um, to the local communities and highlighted sort of, you know, brought different groups in that maybe weren't already involved in the work of the trusts in all cases. So, you know, it, it seems to be, you know, our perspective that all creative approaches are really valuable um, in inclusive engagement and also dealing with bigger issues around like ownership, gentrification, history, like all the big concepts um, lend themselves well to creative approaches. Um, yeah, it, it also, um, not just in my project, but uh, some others like up in the north of Scotland, it highlighted um, the impact on mental health and the lack of services and support uh, during COVID and, and even before that. Um, and that was uh, a very sensitive issue to, to discuss during, during this placemaking project. But um, uh, even I came across uh, some young people saying that uh, more needs to be done to help those with drug addiction in the town. And maybe uh, the majority of the community uh, didn't know or wouldn't address or, or um, aren't aware of this issue, uh, but it's something that, you, that the young people raised. So um, the, the use of a creative approach to, to bring up these, these issues um, was, a, was a meaningful way of, of getting people to listen to each other and to hear, hear the perspectives and, and um, experiences of others that haven't been heard before. Yeah, I mean, the questions of mental health and, you know, and the role of spatial planning and, and community anchor organizations and, you know, inclusive engagement came really strongly out of the Owning Our Futures work, which we're picking up again here. And you can see that relates to the work that Nikki's doing, um, as well as other things Camille and Scotland is trying to delve into those themes more deeply. Um, we've got five minutes. We've got most of our participants are still here. So that's good news. Um, and there's three questions that are open. So I'll maybe just pick up on these last bits if that's good. Um, Alistair's come back on his, his question about politics and it's interesting, it's not what I expected. It said um, he lives in Argyle and Butte. It's traditionally elderly and conservative in terms of the council. So anything that would appear to be community led has to be apolitical so that everyone can be involved in it. So what he's phrasing that as. The focus on being community involving all in the process. I guess it's a question on the difference between rural and urban areas. Um, or as I suppose you understand how politics works through this um, process because yeah, Nikki, go for it if you want. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's going to, that, that, that cohort will be present in most community settings. Um, and and there'll the be more, so we've got, for example, we've got, um, over 70 different languages spoken in our area. And with that, that effectively means that there's, there's a quite a broad cultural matrix there. And you can't, you can't just go ahead, like, so in that sense, being apolitical, as in being sort of neutral or, or just focusing on place uh, as the main focus, I think is the way forward. One of the main tensions we have in, in the area is between um, the, uh, the to to the, uh, along effectively along sectarian traditional kind of West of Scotland sectarian lines, and it's to get these people around the same table. Not that, not that they're necessarily not going around the same table, but they have opposed or sometimes diametrically opposed points of view on things, and that's all about doing some de-escalation work, some some um, some trust building. And having some shared goals and outcomes to work to work towards, and that, that could be applied to any given situation where there's a people with opposing points of view. So in that sense, I it's apolitical. We're not trying to we're not leading the like we're not leading like a Marxist Leninist approach to to placemaking or anything like that. We're not, we're not nor are we adopting a, a particular party's line. Um, Hopefully that's getting closer to what you, what you can answer you're looking for, Alistair. I think these processes have to be inclusive and diverse all at the same time. And perhaps that's what's maybe meant by apolitical in this context. 
they have to be inclusive and diverse while sort of navigating this political context where you know there's developers and there's historical you know conflict. That's it. Not leaving it. Not leaving anybody out uh, at all. You know, just to include everybody. Yeah. All right. We've got three minutes, um, and there's two good questions about resources, and I think that's um, a good place to end on. <laughs> the one of the question is just a thanks, you know, um, and then says it seems we much more. We need much more resource, human and capital, to deliver local place plans. Is there any word on commensurate allocation and resources? And I will say I've noticed that there seems to be variation in resources given to communities to do local place plans. And of course, if existing structures are going to engage in local place plans, they need resource for that as well. And there's a related question about who funds this type of work. Um, yeah. They currently aren't consistently um, and comprehensively well resourced. Uh, they, they, they are a model in the making, though. Um, ideally, I think you, the scale of a local place plan needs to be established as, as what's workable in terms of capacity. I think it probably needs at least one full time worker and an organization behind it with um, uh, a, a, a threshold of requisite resources in order to support the work. I think the ideal would be, however, is uh, the, the work would actually be done by a local area network of, our, of projects and organisations, and I think that's the most sustainable way of doing it. In terms of funding, we, I'm funded through... Um, I'm actually... For, to do this, I'm only funded for 20 hours a week through Investing in Communities Fund from the Scottish Government. We've, we've adapted our kind of funding... Uh, because KPC can do this, we're in, a, we're in a good position to do this. We've adapted it so it can be better resourced. So I'm working on the, full, the local place plan full time for the moment. And I also have half a worker to support me do that. Um, and that's re really the only way it could be done seriously, to be taken seriously and for the, the, the work to be meaningful. So the, the, the situation is that we're actually a, a long way short of what what needs when it needs to be. Um, but that's, that's what we're... we're that's what we're advocating for, is that it's, it's better resourced going forward um, for other places and, uh, across the country, but especially where uh, you, the local place plan has been applied to an area where there is a low baseline of community engagement, a low, low baseline of community resources, uh, and in general, uh, a low baseline of, of, of social, cultural and other forms of capital. Um, that's a good point to end on. I just maybe thought I would pick up and, and say that the Owning Our Futures work was funded, I think, by the National Lottery Foundation. It was. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. good, good. And, you know, that's that was a, a thing, applying for a small grant, but obviously those small grants aren't enough to do the kind of detailed work that Jess did. On the scale, she would like to do it across mm -hmm. Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, so... <laughs> Yeah, more resources is a fundamental question and, and people are looking forward to an announcement perhaps on the topic coming forward, but we will see. Um, it's 3.30, so I'm gonna wrap up. Thanks everyone um, for attending and sticking with us and submitting great question and, and of course our excellent speakers who really gave a great perspective on community-led planning. So thanks for that. Um, and. Thank you. Lots of things coming through. If people have more questions or about all of this, please get in touch um, and we can take the conversations offline as well. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.